Good morning, my name is Joe Wiles, and I serve as a deacon here at Cross Community Church. This morning, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This morning is one of celebration. Uh, we're concluding our series uh, we've just called Growing in the Gospel. What we want for every person who comes here, we say this is our mission, is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, but that doesn't happen, right? Like We get saved, we come to faith in Christ, and we've got to grow into who we now are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes there are old patterns that we have to let go of. There are new things we need to embrace. But as we seek to grow in our relationship with Christ, Christ, as believers and disciples in him, uh, what we don't want to get mixed up, we don't want to get mixed up and think, um, I've got to try harder, I've got to work more. Uh, many people view faith as I've got to avoid the bad things and embrace the good things. And, and so if we try to do that in our own strength, uh, we're destined to fail. It's going to be empty and, and we're not going to live the life that Christ want us, wants us. But if we grow in the gospel, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is so good, if God is so good that he transforms our hearts and makes us new such that we begin to desire the things of God and we uh, come to hate the things of sin, then our lives are transformed just the same. So the final uh, message in this series we're going to be talking about sharing our faith. Now, for, for many of us, when you hear about sharing faith, you're like, oh, that is the last thing I ever want to do. God, I, I'm not even going to like uh, discipline myself to do that. I get uncomfortable. Like, I can't do it. Well, today, uh, what I want to do is just speak to you uh, from the words of Christ uh, about what it means to share the gospel, about why we want to do that, and how the gospel will ultimately compel us to share our faith with a world that desperately needs to hear this message. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 35. Uh, we'll take it one line at a time. Uh, there's not a huge section of text here, uh, but I want to point some things out to you. Read with me here in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9. It says, and Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, and you know, we don't live in the region of Galilee where this would have taken place, we don't understand uh, what was just said uh, via the, the words and the sentences on the page. When it says here that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, um, in the region of Galilee, there were about 200 cities and villages. And so this was no small undertaking. This wasn't like a, hey, no big deal, we'll go knock this out in a week. Uh, this would have been a months-long journey for Jesus, um, city to city, village to village, and then person to person, because it tells us here that he was healing um, every disease and every affliction. And just to kind of give you perspective uh, on what is meant here, disease, the, the first word that, that was used here by the author, um, it's what we think of when we think disease. It's the big, bad, ugly ones. You know what I mean? Like, uh, this is where the lame walk and the blind see. This is a disease that if you had it, uh, people largely would have given up on you ever getting better. Uh, both 2,000 years ago and even now, there are certain things that we know modern medicine can't touch this one. And you're, you're afflicted with this, and you're going to carry it for life. And yet Jesus Christ, as he begins his journey through the villages and through the cities, he's going to people with diseases that you have given up hope ever getting better and he's healing them there, right there on the spot. But there's a second word used that needs to shed a little more light on what Jesus is, is doing here. Um, it's the, the Greek word malakia, which isn't the big, bad, ugly diseases that all of us would want to avoid and, you know, you hope to never get. Uh, but rather, it, it's kind of a lighter thing. These would have been smaller issues. The things that maybe you would think, ah, oh, I can live with this. It's just a little limp, you know, a football injury, whatever. The things that we would say, these aren't maybe life-threatening. They're not going to last forever. Maybe I can handle it on my own. And so here's the picture that we get. 
that both in the big things that people thought were impossible, you need to know that Jesus Christ was sovereign over that thing. Our God is a God who heals, even when the situation seems hopeless. Maybe you're here today, and your situation, whether it be physical or spiritual, you're one of those people that you're like, man, if you only knew my story, if you only knew how bad my sin was, if you knew the things that I'd done, the paths that I walked, like, I'm not sure Jesus could ever work in my heart. Well, I want you to know that Jesus, he went to the, every city and every village and as he encountered the people, he healed every single one, even the ones with the big, big, bad, ugly ones. Now, maybe you're here and yours isn't, you know, one of those, but you still struggle. It still causes you pain. It still causes you heartache. Maybe you should be able to handle it on your own, but you can't. And what we see here is a picture of our God of Jesus Christ caring for people in the midst of what should have been a smaller issue and choosing to act on their behalf to heal what was ultimately hurting them. And so what we can know is that there's nothing too big or too small that we can't bring to Christ, that he doesn't care about, that he doesn't want to work in our lives to bring healing there. But Jesus, he went to every city and every village, and he healed all of their diseases and every affliction. This is the heart of God for us. This is who Jesus is. This is what he, he does for us. Um, but it, it goes on because you need to get more of a picture uh, of what the circumstances were in these particular cities and villages. In verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So as Jesus, he's going from village to village and city to city. And he's spending time there, and he's going into their synagogues, and he's teaching the people. And he's, he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, what Jesus was saying at this point was, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. Like, take heart. You know the kingdom of this world, how broken, how empty, how painful it is. Hey, get excited because the kingdom of God is here. Jesus was there as a Savior. He was going to go to the cross to die for their sin, right? And so he's proclaiming this in all the villages. And one of the reasons he did this is because as he went place to place in village to village, you know what he found in every single place? He found people who were harassed and who were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, the word uh, harassed here, uh, you might hear that word and picture what happens between siblings on every road trip, right? Where they kind of pick at each other and pester each other and like their goal, it is at least with my children every time we get in the car, like I want to make somebody in this car yell. I don't care if it's my brother, sister, or my mom and dad, I'm going to make somebody yell. Like that sort of harassment, right? Um, but that's not really what this word uh, means here. It, it could mean that. Uh, but more uh, explicitly, uh, the word harass would be, it means to cause distress or harm, to mangle. It, it's what the wolf does to the sheep. They destroy and they devour. You see, what Jesus saw as he entered these cities isn't maybe what you and I would have seen if we were there on that day. He didn't see, you know, the buildings and, you know, people and the clothes and all that. Uh, what he saw was into the hearts of men and women. Jesus told us, uh, the thief, our enemy, has come only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life. And as Jesus looked throughout these cities, I believe he saw there what he would see right here if he came to our city. He saw people that maybe looked fine on the outside, but on the inside, uh, they were being devoured by sin. He saw people that maybe, you know, would have put on their clothes and gone to church on Sunday, uh, but behind the facade, behind the clothes, all the stuff, uh, there's an addiction back there that nobody knows about. He saw the woman who's been suffering with depression for years upon years upon years and feels like she's alone. What Jesus saw was into the hearts of men and women. He saw the enemy having his way with them. He saw the destruction that was taking place in their lives. He knew the kid that didn't have a stable home. He knew the abusive environment. He knew the person who was about ready to give up. He saw that the people, though they were functional societies just like ours, they were harassed but there's a second portion of that. These people that were in such a difficult condition, the sins, there were a plenty, right? There were sins of a thousand different flavors that he saw and lives being ruined. Uh, but on top of the fact that they were harassed, being torn apart by their sin, they were also helpless. They couldn't do anything about it. 
They were in this state where try as they might, they couldn't get their stuff together, y'all. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't avoid the substance long enough. They couldn't be the kind of mom that they wanted to be or the kind of husband they wanted to be. They were blowing it in their job. Their finances were a mess, and they were powerless to do anything about it. And so Jesus, he enters into the city and he sees these people, every city, a couple of hundred of them, a couple of hundred thousand people, and everywhere he looks, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Y'all know much about sheep? Sheep without a shepherd, you know what happens to them? They perish. I don't know if you've ever been around sheep very much, but they're not exactly ferocious, right? They're woolly. That's not ferocious, right? You're not, you're not afraid of a sheep generally. Uh, they don't have big teeth. They're not super fast. They're not super strong. And as a matter of fact, when some sort of predator comes after a sheep, you know what its only option is? To run. Like that's all they can do, and they're not very fast. So they get devoured. Without a shepherd to protect them, they get devoured. And, and beyond that, they're not very good at finding good food to eat. They're not very good at finding clean water. They tend to wander off, and if left to their own devices, their wool, it gets dirty and heavy. It begins to become a burden to them, and it can be a source of sickness and disease in their body because they're so filthy and weighed down. As Jesus looks at these people, and I believe Jesus would see the same thing if he looked at us. He sees them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. They need someone to lead them. They need someone to protect them, someone to care for them. And so Jesus begins this journey. He begins going through every city and through every village, through every town. And he went to every individual, regardless of how extreme or how small their need was. Uh, Jesus got in it with them, right? Face-to-face conversations. He listened to the hurts and the brokenness of the people. And he healed every single one of them. Now, I don't know how long this journey took Jesus. Uh, it you know, couldn't have lasted too long. His ministry was probably about three years in total. But he would have spent a number of months traveling city to city and village to village and, and healing person after person after person. But you know the disciples had to grow weary. They had to think about, okay, Galilee is this tiny little place. A couple hundred villages here, a couple hundred thousand people. But we know how big the world is, and they really didn't know quite how big the world was at that point. It must have been overwhelming to them. And yet Jesus, he was motivated by something that kept him going. It tells us here in this verse that he was moved with compassion. Now, um, LaFleur County, there's a couple of different types of compassion. I don't know if y'all know this or not. Uh, The first type of compassion is the bless their heart kind of compassion. You know how it is. Like you see certain people and they've fallen off the wagon again and you're kind of like, bless their heart, are they ever going to get their junk together, right? That's kind of how we think. And you know, it's kind of compassionate because we said bless their heart, right? Um, But that's not what this means at all. Uh, The Greek word here is splugnidzomai, and it means to be moved within one's bowels. If you would have lived in the first century, you would have believed that love, that affection, that um, uh, pity or mercy or compassion, it actually flowed uh, out of your bowels. And so what it means here, the Greek word here, what it means is to be moved to action on someone else's behalf. Like Jesus couldn't just see the brokenness of the cities. He wasn't just going to live his life hanging around his hometown, his friends, like doing his thing. Um, But instead, when he saw the brokenness of the world, he couldn't help but be moved with compassion on behalf of the people, and he had to act. In the third grade, y'all, I got my first whipping at school. If you're a younger person here, schools used to not give you the the pleasure of getting three days off every time you got in trouble. Uh, They took you out in the hall, and they would wear your tail out and then send you back to class. Like, you still had to go to school. And so uh, I was in the third grade, and I was on the playground, and I'm sure I was being perfectly innocent. Uh, And I look up one day, and one of the bigger kids in my class was picking on the smallest kid in my class. And at first, it was kind of the, you know, run-of-the-mill, like, you insult your buddies, and but it kind of escalated from there, and then it was shoving, and then the kid knocked him down, and he jumped right in the middle of him, and he's just letting the smallest kid in our class have it. And um, for me, 
I remember seeing that and, and not thinking, oh, hey, I might get punished for this. You know, I might get in a little trouble. Uh, my dad always promised me if I got whipped at school, I was going to get to get it home. I really didn't consider any of those things. Uh, instead, I just dove right in the middle of it. Like, I couldn't help, like, watching this little bitty kid, like, get pummeled by a much bigger kid. Uh, but there was just one problem with that. I was the second smallest kid in my class. And so uh, it didn't go all that well. Uh, I took a few shots, and luckily a teacher showed up in time to kind of break us up, and uh, she didn't want to listen to my explanation. She still lined me up and whipped my tail and sent me back to class, and I had to tell my dad. And it's a really sad story. I hope you all feel bad for me. I was trying to do a good thing there. When you, when you hear this word, splugnizomai, it's not one that thinks about self. It's not one of the things, well, what, you know, what might happen to me if I do this? What's it going to cost me? What are the consequences to me? It's one that is so moved with seeing a need that you kind of lose sight of yourself and you're only focused on the well-being of the other person. And that's where Jesus was, the King of kings and Lord of lords who took on flesh, who came to earth. Jesus is going city to city and village to village person to person. Some of these people had diseases that were very infectious. As a matter of fact, they might have to call out, unclean, or they had to live outside of the city. They couldn't even get close to people because people didn't want what they had. And yet Jesus, he gets right up close to them and moved with compassion. He listens to their stories. He sees their sickness. He spends his time healing the diseases and the afflictions, the big ones and the small ones. Now, again, this job must have been overwhelming. I wonder if it lasted all day. Like, if you just think about the, the number of sick people, you know, in any village with a few thousand people, uh, it's a big job. They didn't have modern medicine, right? I wonder if he wore himself out day after day after day, caring for the people, teaching them, the sheep without a shepherd, teaching them the way, teaching them from the Old Testament, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of these people. He was moved with compassion on their behalf. But it must have got tiring. And so at some point, I don't know if the disciples were wondering, like, how long is this going to go on? Seems like the need's kind of overwhelming. Uh, but Jesus decides to tell him, hey, here's my plan. Um, I know that I can't possibly meet all the needs. I can't go to every city and every place. I won't, you know, be in every town. I won't live in every generation. I won't live in every century or millennium. Um, here's my plan that this healing and redemptive work can continue throughout, you know, the whole world and throughout all of the ages. He looks at his disciples in verse 37. He said, the harvest is plentiful. Look around you guys, you see the need. And you see the lines, you see the crowds, the people who are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The harvest is plentiful. The problem here is that the workers are few. And so he tells them in verse 38, he says, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And we need more people to help us in this work. And so it's interesting because he tells them to pray. And I don't know if the disciples did what maybe you or I do. If someone comes to me and, and you're talking to me and you're like, hey, would you pray for my, you know, my great aunt's sister's friend and wherever, uh, I'm going to pray right then and there probably while we're still talking uh, because I don't always have a pencil and paper to remember it. I'm going to pray immediately because I don't want to forget to do that, right? I, I think the disciples, when Jesus is like, hey, you need to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into the harvest field, I wonder if they didn't just begin to pray like, you're right. Man, I see the need. I see the pain. I see the hurt of the people. God, would you send out workers? Because in the very, if you're to jump into chapter 10, you know what he did? After they, they prayed, he gathers them together. He's like, hey, guys, <clears throat> I'm going to give you authority uh, over unclean spirits to heal, to do the things, and I'm going to send you out. You guys are going out. You're going to go across the kind of the known world at this time. You're going to begin to do what you've seen me doing. I want you to go, and I want you to teach in the synagogues. And I want you to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. I want you to heal the sick. I want you guys to begin to do that. And Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest, empowered them for that work. I believe that that's exactly what Christ would want for us. But before we get into our role in this, can I just tell you uh, a few things that this passage teaches us about Jesus? Number one, um, Jesus went to the people. You think about who he was, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is in heaven, which we all long for, right? Like uh, there's no sickness, there's no hurting, there's no death, there's no pain. Like heaven is perfect. He's up there uh, worthy of all glory and honor and power and praise and all those things. That's who Jesus was. And yet when he looked down at the world, he saw people who were harassed and helpless. 
He saw people who thought there was no hope that they're going to get any better. He saw people struggling and being ravaged by sin, and they were helpless to do anything about it. And in his love for us, he came. Jesus took on flesh, God. He took on flesh, the weakness of human flesh. And he became a servant, city to city, village to village, person to person, moved with compassion. He went to them. He listened to them. He cared for them. Um, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe you're here today and, and, and you don't know Jesus Christ at all. Maybe someone just invited you today and you showed up, and here's what I want you to know. Just as Jesus went after those people in those cities and those villages and the towns, I want you to know that Jesus Christ is coming after you. What he desires to do in you is to set you free from the things that have been bringing destruction into your life. And he wants to lead you to new life in him. He would come and he would teach you and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to you. That you, there's salvation for your sins and there's new life in Christ Jesus. Like he would be coming after you. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that our God is a God who leaves the 99 sheep in the open pasture. And he goes and he chases after the one that is lost. And maybe that's you today, and you don't know why you're here. Uh, but I, what I would hope is that you understand is that Jesus Christ is pursuing you, and he wants to bring healing to your life just as he did these people. He wants to transform you and make you new in him. But maybe today you're here, and you've been a believer for a while. You're one of us that should have your stuff together by now. You've been a believer for a year, two years, five years, ten years, thirty years. And yet, you find yourself struggling with those same old sins. That same old ailment that you've been carrying with you for years and years and years. Or maybe it's something new that's popped up in your life. And maybe you're kind of ashamed to even come to Jesus. I want to remind you that Jesus healed the things that were big, and he healed the things that were small. There weren't people that he didn't have compassion on. He went to the cities, and he's coming after us. And he wants to bring redemption into our lives as well. Jesus loves you and he cares for you. Number two, number one, Jesus went to the people. Number two, uh, Jesus had compassion on them. Yeah. This had to be hard sometimes. Because in the midst of going to the cities and the villages and healing all the people, you know people still rejected them. They still mocked him. They still scorned him. I mean, ultimately, uh, some of these people may be the very ones who would uh, call for his crucifixion. Have him arrested and shout, crucify him as he stood there before Pilate on that day. And yet when Jesus looked at the people, he wasn't concerned about himself. He was moved with compassion for them, so much so that he ultimately would willingly endure the beatings from the Roman soldiers, the agony of the cross, enduring the wrath of God for them. He was moved with compassion on behalf of the people, even to the point that it cost him his own life. And I want you to know he has compassion for you too. Maybe you've blown it again. <laughs> Maybe you can't get your stuff together. But Jesus, when he looks at you, he's not disappointed. He's not shaking his head in disapproval. And what he sees is someone that he loves. And he desires to bring redemption into your life. The third thing we see about Christ is that he served the people. Uh, he got his hands dirty here, y'all. He didn't do this from a distance. This wasn't like a, a YouTube video or a Facebook post like, hey, Jesus loves you. Jesus literally went to the people. As a matter of fact, throughout his earthly ministry, uh, he was often questioned, like, why do you hang out with people like that? Did you know that's a prostitute? Did you know that's a tax collector? Did you know that guy's an addict? And yet Jesus, he met the people where they are, and he served them right where they were. People that needed teaching, he taught Declaring the gospel of the kingdom to those who needed to hear. Physical healing for those who needed that in their lives. He served. So Jesus went, moved by compassion, and he served the people. But the final thing that I want us to see before we turn and look at ourselves here, number four, is that Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. You know, there were no hopeless situations in those cities. There were no people that Jesus couldn't reach. There were no people uh, that were beyond salvation. They were so bad, their sins couldn't be overcome. Uh, Jesus was the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that does the work, y'all. Um, when he sent his disciples out, they didn't go out in their own name or their own strength. 
He gave them authority. It was his power. It was in his, in his name that they would do the healing. And so for us, we need to understand that it's not up to us to save anyone or change anybody. We're powerless. If you've ever dealt with, in particular, an addict in your life, you know how this goes. Like it is so frustrating and you try so hard and you just can't seem to change anything. Well, guess what? You can't change anything. But Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest and he's sovereign over all things. There is hope in every single circumstance because Jesus is Lord. And so for what about, what about for us as the church of Jesus Christ? And we know the gospel, that what we, what we did was sin. We all sinned against God. You and I have done it. You know, you yelled at your kids. You didn't all, done the things you swore you would never do. We've sinned against God, but God saw us just like he saw these people. He saw how sin was having its effects in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our single lives. Like he saw the brokenness. Jesus Christ saw all of that, and he went to the cross. In the midst of our sin, he demonstrated his love by going to the cross to die for us. He died the death that our sin deserved. The wages of sin is death. You and I, we were condemned to an eternity in hell and separation from God. But Jesus didn't want us to go through life as sheep without a shepherd. So he went to the cross for us. And he offered his life there. He endured the wrath that we deserved. He gave his life that we might find new life. And so as men and women who are recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how should we respond? Um, number one, uh, the gospel should make us glad. Uh, when you hear the good news of Jesus Christ, it ought to be good news to you. Like, we ought to be people of joy. Now, there's a couple of different tracks that your life can run on. There is the, the track of kind of the kingdom of this world, right? And so if your focus is, am I killing it in terms of the kingdom of this world, which means how are my finances doing? Am I excelling in my business? You know, do I have that pretty happy postcard kind of family? Am I, you know, aligning with all the metrics of this world? And if that's the path you're walking, you're likely to be disappointed because it is an empty one that can never satisfy you. There's always more money. There's always more fame. There's always more things, right? But here's the thing. If we're looking to those empty things to make us feel joy or gladness or full, and we're bound to be disappointed, but here's the hope. There's another path that our life can run on. It's the one of the kingdom of God, where we would say, we deserve death Man, I've blown it so massively, and it's true of this pastor. I've told my story here. Man, I, I, I have blown it so in such a big way that I did not deserve the grace of Jesus Christ in my life. And I literally did things I swore I would never do. In the moment of brokenness where I thought, I've lost my marriage and my family. I'll never serve another day in ministry. Jesus Christ met me there. And he poured out his love and his grace and his mercy on me where there was no illusion of my own goodness. And so you know what? Sometimes in our family, our finances are doing a little better and sometimes they're doing a little worse. And sometimes my kids are killing it and, you know, school's awesome and everything's going well and I think my family's perfect. And sometimes they're mouthing me back and, and not acting in ways that I think that they should. And there's days my marriage is, is perfect and there's days where we're struggling. But you know what? I always have reason to be glad because I deserved death and eternal separation from God, and Jesus Christ has lavished his grace and mercy on me. The gospel makes us glad. In every single circumstance, God has been good to me. So the gospel makes us glad. Number two, the gospel gives us compassion. If, if we were honest, and we just kind of polled everybody in the room here and asked you, hey, have you ever been judged by a church person? Have you ever had someone look down on you, call you out because of your sin and maybe they were ignorant of their own? And I'm not talking about people that are like trying to admonish you to faithfulness in Christ, but people that just shake their head at you, look down on you, think they're better than you. There is this thing that happens for us when we, as believers of Jesus Christ, who deserved death, right, who deserved eternal separation from God, but found his grace and his mercy, somehow we begin to convince ourselves that we're pretty good. And we often do that by looking down on other people. How could, how could he act like that? How could she do that thing? And how could he continue in that addiction? Doesn't he love his family? How could she be such a terrible mother, right? And we begin to look down on others. Um, 
The moment you find yourself looking down on other people, you need to understand that you've taken your eyes off of the cross. The truth of it is, is that every single one of us has sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. And what we should be filled with as we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ is the same compassion that Jesus Christ showed us. We were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And as we look around us and we see that in other people's lives, we ought to be moved with compassion and not self-righteousness. The gospel makes us glad. The gospel gives us compassion. And the final thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ is what compels us to go. Because we were the lost sheep. And Jesus Christ left the 99 and he came after us. As somebody somewhere shared the gospel with us, and we might have heard it a thousand times, but that one time more that we heard it, it clicked with us, and we understood the gospel. And Jesus Christ has come, and he's transformed our lives. Here's what happens because of the gospel. Because we see what Jesus has done for us, because he's a God who went, because he's a God who had compassion, then we are a people who go, and we are a people of compassion. Can I ask you a question? Who in your life is harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd? These people don't always look down and out, y'all. It's true. In this county, in this city, there are people dying in addiction. There are families that are so broken by abuse and dysfunction, it's everywhere. But sometimes it's true that they look pretty good on the outside. They might look like up-and-comers, and yet for them, they're still harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Who's that person in your life? Is it a family member? A co-worker? The frustrating one that you try to avoid working alongside? Is it that neighbor? A person in the city that you struggle to be around? Here's what Jesus instructed us to do. When we see people who are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus, number one, he instructed us to pray. Pray that God would send a worker into the harvest field, that they might be saved, that they might experience the same grace and transformation that we have experienced as the people of God, that God might touch their heart in the same way that he touched ours, that he would open their eyes and give them ears to hear the gospel, and that they would be transformed. They don't have to live lives of being destroyed by sin anymore. So we pray, and it says pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. God, would you send somebody that they might hear, that they might know, that they might understand the the life that's available in you. There's forgiveness of sin. There's freedom from addiction. We pray earnestly. Number one, but number two, we go. To these men who he called on to pray in one verse, he sent them out in the next few weeks ago, we trained 160 people in this church in a simple gospel presentation. Y'all, we aren't the lords of the harvest. Jesus is, right? He's the one that does the saving, but he's called on us to go out and do the sharing. Man, that you would see the need in your neighborhood and that you'd be willing to get your hands dirty. And you might not worry about your reputation and some of the people that you would hang around that you would go to those people and you would spend time with them. You would listen to them. You would see their hurts. You would care for them, minister to them in the midst of their pain and their brokenness. And you begin to teach them just as Jesus did. And that you would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for them. Y'all, people need to know that Christ loves them. They need to know that God's not mad at them. He doesn't hate them. He hasn't rejected them. But rather, that Jesus Christ has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And what we've got to understand is the harvest is plentiful. Man, in our city, it's true. Look around. The pain and the brokenness is everywhere. The problem here in this city is not broken people. It's a lack of workers going to the harvest field. So our prayer and our hope for our church is that we're going to be the church in this city. And we're going to pray for people with boldness and earnestness. And then we're going to be willing to go and trust in the Lord of the harvest to do the work. Would you bow with me? Father, we praise you uh, for your goodness. We praise you for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which found men like me. 
who'd done things they swore they'd never do. God, I had every chance to get it right, and I still blew it. And yet you and your grace, you met me in my moment of deepest need. God, you poured out your love and your grace and your mercy upon me. And God, that story is told 50 times over in this room. God, we pray that this church would be a church of people who offer ourselves to you, that we carry the gospel with us wherever we go, that we would be moved with that same compassion uh, that you had upon the people. Father, for the people in this room that don't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that you would help them to hear the gospel for the, for the first time, to understand it for the first time, even if they've heard it a hundred times. For those who are here and they're believers, but their lives are full of sin and pain and brokenness, I pray that today would be the day that you bring healing into their hearts so they can confess sin and be healed. Father, our hope is in you. You're the Lord of the harvest, and we pray that you would have your way in our midst. I pray this in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.